Right. One of the most controversial religious figures of, of both antiquity uh, and today is that of, of Lilith. Now, he's understood by many uh, different identities uh, dependent upon uh, the culture and, and the air, as she uh, frequently evolves from one kind of being to another. <laughs> For the Sumerians and the Babylonians, uh, Lilith was the daughter of heaven, closely associated with the goddess Inanna, right? While for the Assyrians and early Israelites, she was primarily a water elemental spirit. Uh, by the time we get uh, to the 8th to 10th century CE, uh, Lilith evolves into Adam's first wife, arising from the very same dust as Adam when she was created, in contrast to being fashioned from uh, Adam's rib, as was the case with Eve. Yet Lilith will abandon Adam for the archangel Samael. Right. Lilith will also be depicted in ancient and medieval Jewish literature as everything from uh, a monster and a serpent to a succubus draining away the life force of unsuspected men as they sleep. But of course, uh, this talk is going to be pretty interesting uh, in the sense that I'm going to take the evidence chronologically. Uh, so as the evidence appears, that is the time we'll, where I will discuss uh, Lilith and her significance. Does that make sense? So I'm going to go, and that means, well, we have to be very careful here. That means is that certain ideas may have dated earlier than the time that I mentioned them. You following? But I'm mentioning them at the time they first appear. So. It doesn't mean that certain ideas didn't exist before, uh, but I think the chronological approach is the best uh, in the academic sense. So we're going to go back uh, to the time of the ancient Sumerians, right? Um, so the Sumerian word, uh, well, first of all, we have to mention the fact that uh, Lilith, we have to look at the name, Lilith. And uh, the Sumerian word, Lil, uh, using our letters, L-I-L, -L, the word means air. That's what lil means. It means air. So when we refer to, for example, uh, the god with the name of Enlel, right, uh, the Sumerian lord, the word lord is en, and of course, uh, he is lord of the L, uh, the lil, excuse me, of the air. So he is in Lel, Lord of the Air. So it does mean air at first. Uh, the oldest uh, known term, which we might suggest relates uh, to Lilith, would be the plural word Lily. Uh, of course, it could have also been the feminine Lilith too, which was uh, simply a Sumerian genetic word, uh, generic word, excuse me, uh, for the word spirit. In fact, uh, it was quite common in ancient languages for the same word for air or breath to be used for spirit, as the spirit was thought to be the evidence of life, spirit of the person, uh, embodied uh, spirits, therefore, were themselves composed of the same substance. The very word uh, spiritus is one such example, uh, Latin for breath. Uh, the Hebrew word rauch, right, is another uh, such example. This suggests, therefore, that the Sumerian lilitu were either a specific kind of demon or were just simply spirits in general. You guys follow this, right? Now, there is evidence also that she was also called Ninlel. Now, Ninlel means lady air. So, Nin is lady, Lil is air, uh, who was the goddess of the south wind, as well as the wife, guess of whom? Inlel, right? And it was also known as connected with the moon, Itut. With uh, this sense, of course, uh, th this you can see there's a connection between uh, Enlil, this god, 
and Lilith. I told you this is going to be pretty technical at first, but we got to establish these ideas right away. Now, here we go. And this is something that you do want to hear because there's lots of confusion here. Okay. Later on, after the time of the Sumerians, when the Akkadians arrive, Akkadians arrive, these are Semitic people, into Mesopotamia, specifically under Sargon the Great, uh, the name changes. Okay, so Lilake now stands for Lilith. And even though it, it's referred to in the Sumerian tradition as spirit demon, it conflates with a Semitic word, which is, of course, El El, which means night. So as a result, the name morphs and means a nocturnal female night being or spirit. You guys following that? So, so originally, right, uh, Lilith, the word in the Sumerian, right, is connected to air, but because of the resemblance of that word, when the Akkadians arrive, when these Semitic people arrive, they hear this word and they make a connection to the word night because of the same, because of similar root in the Semitic language. And a lot of scholars get this mixed up because they say, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. The answer is it's both. It evolves. Now we got the step. Just getting through the name, so <coughs> it can be complicated. Now, according to a work, a uh, Sumerian uh, work known as Gilgamesh and the Netherworld, Inanna uh, planted a willow tree in her garden in Uruk. This is called a hulupu tree. H u l u p p u. That she later intended to make a new throne from uh, its wood. Uh, now, the story uh, goes basically as follows. Once upon a time, the story goes is that uh, when the separation of sky and earth occurred, a violent south wind from a storm uprooted this tree, and Inanna rescued it and planted it in her sacred grove in Uruk. Now, many people will say, what is this tree? What does it mean? What is its significance? Uh, it seems that this tree is connected to the world tree, you know, the ancient uh, archetype, the idea of this tree that connects the heavens, the earth, and the underworld together, right? Now, Inanna declares, quote, I brought it to my holy garden. I tended the tree waiting for my shining throne and bed. So she intends to turn the world tree <laughs> into furniture. <laughs> ah, okay, so uh, there you have it. Well, 10 years later, when Inanna was ready to cut down the tree uh, to make into her, her throne or into her bed, uh, she discovers three creatures had settled into this particular tree. Uh, and it goes as follows. I'm just reading uh, from the text. Then a serpent not be charmed, made its nest in the roots of a tree. The undo bird that is young in the branches of the tree and the dark made Lilith built her home in the trunk. So we see that the tree is now, uh, now has three occupants, right? There is a serpent at the root, right? You've got an undo bird at the top. And then in the middle, uh, you have this dark maid, this lily, right? It continues, I wept, how I wept, yet they would not leave my tree, uh, says Inanna. Uh, since, uh, accordingly, uh, uh, the snake, which fears no spell, that means that Inanna can't get rid of the snake, Inanna asks her brother Utu, who's the sun god to help, but he, he refuses. So she calls upon Bilgamesh. Uh, Bilgamesh is also known as Gilgamesh, 
right, to slay the serpent. And he does so. Uh, the story continues. Gilgamesh fastened his armor of 50 minas around his chest. The 50 minas weighed as little to him as 50 feathers. He lifted his bronze axe, the axe of the road, weighing seven talents and seven minas to his shoulder. He entered Imana's holy garden. Gilgamesh struck the serpent who could not be charmed, unquote. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. So Gilgamesh is able to do uh, what uh, Imana could not. Uh, this is interesting. And um, I do want to say that uh, there is some, there is, there's something interesting about Gilgamesh. Uh, there is uh, an early reference to a demon that's similar to Lilith uh, and uh, was a companion uh, of, uh, uh, that, uh, that was of um, uh, Gilgamesh's father, who was known as Lilu. So there could be some connection here. Who knows, right? Now, again, uh, we talked about the idea of the world tree, right? You see, you see that uh, the concept of the world tree uh, is everywhere. You can even see this uh, in Mesoamerica or North America. And they oftentimes have monsters and serpents at the base, and they oftentimes have birds at the top. So it's interesting to see these connections. Now, let's go a little bit deeper uh, because the full word that is used in this text is ki so ki li la ki and uh this is that which made its home within the trunk of the tree uh, in response to the impending threat this lilith as we heard destroys its own home and then sets off for the forest <laughs> while uh, many translate the word li la ki as owl <laughs> Uh, because of its placement within the trunk of the tree, because, you know, owls habitually occupy trunks. Uh, a lot of scholars will say, well, a better translation uh, is, is simply a spirit, and, and even better still, water spirit by this period of time, that is connected uh, to the night, the nocturnal aspect. So uh, you can see that this Lilith then uh, originally connected to the element of the air is now connected to the element of water and perhaps best both. So, now, of course, this is the first uh, reference uh, to Lilith. That's around uh, 2000 BCE. And uh, many aspects that would later be associated with her are already inferred. Uh, first, of course, you see this association of Lilith uh, with the snake. And sometimes uh, the snake is referred to or connected to the idea of craftiness, of wisdom, the positive side of the scale. And of course, uh, with evil in the Judeo Christian conception. Uh, second, uh, now there is the bird who flees. Uh, and, of course, it's presumed that um, uh, Lilith uh, will also later fly from the scene as well. So she is the one who is always in motion. She's always in flight. Uh, and so, I mean, she's able to fly. So maybe the association with wings that we see Lilith right later on. A third on the tree does invoke the idea of the tree of knowledge. We see that Lilith seems to be very much properly placed, right? right. And so, um, and she is not only in this tree, uh, but this tree is in Inanna's holy garden. And come on, we can't help but connect that to the idea of, um, well, the Garden of Eden, right? So you're seeing that here, right? Uh, finally, of course, uh, it is noteworthy that uh, while Lilith and her companions inspire fear in Imana, they do not have a fear of her. There is no fear of Lilith, right? Now, of course, Gilgamesh uh, here is the superhero who kills the snake and 
frightens the other uh, creatures out of the tree and garden. Uh, so in this sense, Inanna is portrayed as ineffectual to these three creatures for what they represent and requires this assistance. Uh, but, um, but who is Lilith? Who is she, right? So there is a, a few other stories. There's another story where Lil Laki, uh, uh, in the story of uh, another story, somehow relates to Nin Lel. Nin Lel. We talked about that before, right? The, the Lady of the Air, right? She be known as Lady Air, she be known as Lady of the Wind, or Lady of the Open Field, uh, who was the wife of In Lel. There seems to be an early connection between them. Uh, and there is a nice, uh, very interesting myth that is so important uh, for us to study. It's the myth of Inlel and Minlel. <laughs> I'm glad I'm the one trying to say these words. <laughs> Inlel and Minlel. Okay. Uh, the beginning of Nana, right? Uh, this is a, a Sumerian creation myth uh, dating from the mid to late third millennium. It's discovered at the Temple Library of the Poor, uh, translated in 1918, right? Been around uh, for a little while. The story begins <clears throat> uh, describing the city of Nippur, which is presented as the abode of the gods, right? One of the inhabitants of this heavenly Nippur before the founding of the world was Ninlel. He lived here. Now, what happens uh, accordingly is that the uh, Inlel was one of its young men uh, of the inhabitants of this heavenly city, and Ninlel was one of its young women. Now, the goddess by the name of Nunbar Sigunu is then introduced, uh, depicted as warning. Uh, her daughter, Ninlel, <laughs> about Inlel. Inlel is, is the bad guy, you know, he's the bad boy. You gotta stay away from him. <laughs> don't don't hang around him. Well, uh, he's all a bunch of hot air. <laughs> uh, and especially uh, his uh, <clears throat> intentions uh, towards her, which were not exactly uh, respectful, uh, and 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 told her and, uh, to not stray close to the river. You know, apparently, and Lel uh, liked to hang out in the river area which uh, is the bad side of town of the heavenly city, uh, perhaps, right? Uh, well, Enlil tried to resist Enlil's first approach, trying to show that uh, she was not interested. And um, after which, uh, uh, he entreats his minister, Nuska, to take him across the river on the other side. Uh, and so that the couple could meet and they could float downstream. Uh, either, uh, sometimes the text is hard to figure out what it says, either they're bathing going downstream or they're in a boat at this point. You know, we know he crosses the boat over to the other side to you know, get together with her. We're not sure what happens when they start to travel down. I'm actually looking at the text right here. <laughs> it's, it's fun to try to interpret what it is here. Uh, but, uh, but eventually, they lie on the bank together, and they kiss and conceive soon Akimbabar, the moon god. <laughs> what a kiss can do, right? Just, you know, this is why you should not kiss, because you could conceive the moon god. Well, all right. Sorry, then. That's to Enlil. Uh, walking about uh, where the other gods <clears throat> arrest him. I told you this is going to be an interesting story. Uh, and arrest him for the relationship uh, with Enlil. Uh, and they exile him uh, from the city for being richly impure. Now, I hope you guys caught this, right? They're not married. This is an extra marital affair, right? You know, she's supposed to be pure. She's supposed to listen to mama, right? Don't, you know, hang around with the bad boy across the river. But uh, it turned out that, um, you know, she's pregnant with uh, Moongar. 
<laughs> and, uh, and he uh, violated ritual purity, right? So what happens is, it, uh, well, 50 great gods and, and seven gods who decide destinies had Enlil arrested. As I said, Enlil was ritually impure. He must leave the city. Uh, and accordingly, uh, he was thrown out. Well, where else do you go but to the underworld? It's kind of, you know, a lot of options here. Heavenly city, not so heavenly city. And uh, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, he starts to go down. Now, now, this is where it gets really complicated. I'll have to explain this uh, in this, uh, because it's, hey, this is, this is Mesopotamian mythology. So as he's going down the, into the underworld, he tells basically three of the guardians on the way down. He gives them a message. Uh, he gives a message to the keeper of the city gate, known as the keeper of the holy barrier or the man of the pure luck. Uh, he gives a message to the guard known as Ikura, uh, who guards the Sumerian River of the Underworld, which is similar to the River of Styx. And lastly, uh, he, he, he gives a message to uh, Sliugi, the Underworld Ferryman, who is similar to Pharaoh. Uh, what is that message as he's going down and down into the Underworld? Well, the message is as follows. He says that when your lady Menlel comes, if she asks after me, don't you tell her where I am. Okay, here it is. When your lady Menlel comes, if she asks after me, don't you tell her where I am. Well, so you can guess what happens. Yes, Menlel follows him. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Asking each one, when did your Lord and now go by on his way, you know, down into the underworld? To this, they tell her, each one, my Lord has not talked with me at all, O loveliest one, and Lel has not talked to me at all. Upon which each one offers to have sex with them. You guys catch that one? And each time they conceive another god. So we're looking at, you know, uh, these guardian, these three guardians on the way down into the underworld. Uh, and she has sex with each one of them. And with each one of them, she conceives uh, another god. Apparently, uh, when it comes to these gods, uh, it's kind of instantaneous. There's no, there's no waiting around for, for nine months, you know. You know, it's like kiss and woo, you know, moon god. <laughs> so, so this is what's happening here. Uh, so there's no there's no crowding of the womb here. I, I guess, you know, uh, there's no womb with a view. Okay, so what happens uh, is they go, they're on their way down. And so and now you're going to have, of course, the various offsprings, as I mentioned before. Uh, but I do want to mention one more thing, is that each one of these spirits have the spirit of Enlil in them. What? I know. That's why it's taking my time. So even though they are embodied different guardians and guides as you go down, each one is infused with the spirit of Enlil who waits for her at the very bottom. You guys get that? So she's having a relationship with them, but she's also having a relationship with Enlil. Because he is this, well, he's the spirit of the air, after all, right? Okay, so uh, the various gods, uh, Enlil is, uh, she gives birth with the gatekeeper to Nurgle, the god of death, right? Uh, so there you have it. And then with the, uh, the river god, uh, she's impregnated and uh, uh, she gets... Uh, uh, she gets impregnated by the uh, the man of the river of the mother world, a man devouring river. And then, of course, uh, she's also gets pregnant with the god of rivers and canals. <laughs> so, uh, there you have it. Okay, so uh, now, finally, okay, they meet together. Yay, we finally got that far. Uh, 
So this, what happens now is all of these act, because now she's made the way through via all the Enlels who are infused in all these guardians. Enlel waits at the bottom. But remember, there is that moon god she was first pregnant with. Remember that? Well, that moon god descended with Enlel down to the bottom. Now a passage has been made so that through this ritual, right, this sexual energy moving down, which through these guardians, which are infused with the spirit of the melt, right, what happens is a pathway has been made for the moon to rise out of the underworld. And that's why the moon rises. That's kind of beautiful, right? <laughs> and so, so a passage is made for the moon to rise up with Enlel, god of the air, rising in triumph with, of, of course, uh, with Enlel. It is, it is rather beautiful, right? Uh, and so you kind of have a, a happy ending, right? The story concludes, you are Lord, you are King Enlel, you are Lord, you are King. And I mean, it's pretty, pretty good, right? You know? Lord who makes barley grow, Lord of heaven and plenty, and so forth, yada, yada. Uh, and of course, praise was spoken for Ninlel, the mother. Praise be to the great mountain, right? I mean, they're, they're singing praises happily ever after. But uh, you can see, uh, in, you see that uh, there is, uh, uh, she started off, right? Not too bad, <laughs> right? Uh, not doing too badly. So you're going to see, unfortunately, uh, how everything goes downhill from here. Are you guys following that, right? Uh, so the Lilith aspect that we see in Ninlel uh, seems to be a pretty positive one. But, um, but, but, but there is this, the sex concept, right? Um, you know, this is society um, uh, in Mesopotamia uh, prohibited uh, premarital sex Sort of, <laughs> uh, for those who are married, but not those who are not 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 so much, uh, and so, so you have, so what is this? Well, the idea is is that what the gods and goddesses do are outside of of of, of human, uh, uh, of human understanding. Okay, and um, but beyond that, uh, there is an exception amongst the Sumerians, amongst the Babylonians, even go to the Assyrians, and that is, the exception is what we understand as sex magic. In that case, that magic is done for the reasons of, well, of giving that energy that is made to nature, right? So you're, the, the energy between a male and female uh, is released and is considered a holy energy that feeds creation and enacts various things. Well, you saw that, ooh, sorry, saw that directly uh, in the story of the descent, right? Saw that. And so this is being stressed. Now, of course, uh, the narrative concludes that it exonerates in Lel, in the Lel, uh, that nature. Uh, can have its way that moves beyond societal conventions, right? Uh, and so there is this outlet that is allowed, that's permitted. And you're thinking, are we at the Lilith yet? We've been talking about Lilith the whole time. We're talking about Lilith within this context. And you can see, if you guys know Lilith pretty well, you can see what aspects will now be distorted as time goes on, right? As opposed to positive sexuality it moves into negative sexuality. As opposed to positive uh, interactions or the feeding of nature, it becomes the idea of, hey, I have no choice, you know? Uh, uh, the succubus came around and I was sleeping. Are you guys getting this, right? So yes, there is a, a direct connection. Uh, so what will happen is, is that Lilith will be connection, connected to ritual prostitution uh, in Mesopotamia belief that this energy was able to manifest to the natural realm uh, uh, life-giving uh, power 
and that it cannot be ignored, right? Uh, now, of course, after her death, as she dies, even though she's a goddess, uh, Nenlel becomes the goddess of the wind, like Enlel. And she is connected uh, to the south wind. Sound familiar? Referred to in the story of Adapa, as her husband Enlel was associated with the northerly winter storms. Okay, so there you have it. Now, uh, we have a famous relief. It's called the Bernie Relief. It was named uh, after its owner in 1936, uh, Mr. Sidney Bernie, uh, that gives, uh, that has been associated with Lilith. Uh, the, the very popular one that you oftentimes see, with her arms out and so forth. I do want to say that uh, it's it's a made out of terracotta. It's 50 by 37 centimeters. Um, and um, uh, th th we re realized that it was originally painted a red overall, uh, even the wings, although the wings alternated between red and black. That the pubic triangle and the area uh, were accented with red pigment. Uh, so you have that, but basically it is a nude figure, uh, realistically sculpted in high relief. Her eyes beneath are very distinct. Uh, they have joined eyebrows. <clears throat> and um, presumably there was uh, something that was inlaid in those eyes at one time, uh, possibly alabaster, right? Lips are full, uh, slightly upturned at the corners. So it does look like she is smiling. And that's important for us to remember later on. She's adorned with a four-tiered headdress of horns, topped with a disc. Her head is framed by two braids of hair, with the bulk of her hair uh, placed into a, a button in the back. I don't know why I'm indicating that. Um, uh, there's, of course, uh, two wedge-shaped braids extending onto her breasts. Uh, the stylized treatment of her hair could represent a ceremonial wig. Many people have thought that this is just just it's a lot of hair, you know. Uh, she wears a single broad necklace composed of squares that are are, are structured in, in a horizontal uh, with horizontal vertical lines, so, uh, possibly depicting beads, maybe possibly around both her wrists. She wears bracelets, which appear composed of three rings. Uh, she has two wings, which are clearly defined. Stylized feathers and three registers, which extend above her shoulders. Her wings uh, are not fully extended, but she does have wings. Uh, she does have bird feet, right? Very detailed, with uh, three well-separated toes of approximately equal length. There are owls that are connected to her. They're very recognizable, but they're not very they're not very realistic at all. Um, and so you can see that uh, she is definitely a goddess, but it, it, does, it does look like there's a combination here of various themes, amalgamation of both Inanna uh, and Lilith, right? Uh, so you have Inanna's rod and ring and the Shigura crown, for example, and the lions. But you also have Lilith's uh, draped wings, her frontal nakedness, her owl feet, and the horned crown. So it is, it is a combination. Uh, it's Lilith Inanna, right? Interestingly enough, the rod and the ring uh, have uh, various interpretations. Uh, sometimes it is connected to, uh, this rod and ring is connected to the idea of survey. It may be connected to the idea of kingship. They're known as a miku and puku. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, uh, many have suggested that the ring and the stick might refer to the female or male principles, uh, it's, it's possible, but uh, we don't know. Now, Lilith association with Inanna uh, is found in many other Sumerian and Babylonian accounts. Uh, one, of course, is uh, called the Anne Maiden of Inanna. Uh, another, uh, we find here uh, that Lilith, uh, like Inanna, uh, uh, was considered very beautiful. Uh, Lilith was actually described as a, quote, 
beautiful maiden. So early on, Lilith is beautiful, very beautiful. Uh, but Lilith was also described as a perpetual maiden, always a maiden, for her breasts were always barren of milk, as was her womb, eternally barren of any child. In fact, an early aspect of Lilith is that she could not bear children. <clears throat> now, like Inanna, Lilith was connected to ritual of prostitution, as we discussed, inspiring sexual activity with men so that the resulting union would bring about uh, fertility magic, uh, directing this energy towards fields and animals. One Sumerian text states as follows, Inanna has sent the beautiful, unmarried, and seductive prostitute Lilithu out into the fields and streets in order to lead men astray. Lilith only inspired uh, sexual uh, activity amongst the unmarried. Uh, those who were often strangers to one another. Uh, uh, she was not about human reproduction either. Uh, for these unions, it was not about having a child. In fact, that was improper uh, to procreate with a maiden that's connected with Lilith. No, 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 no. That energy is not connected to the womb. It's connected to a life of animals and the fields and so forth. And you can see how that will change into this, 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 uh, uh, the idea of Lilith being, you know, a problem when it comes to children. See how it's like telephone ideas become exaggerated through time. I hope you feel like you're getting to know Lilith a little bit more as we're going through this, you know, and how you can see things going to change as time goes on. Lilith is often described as having uh, been a Sumerian succubus. Uh, there were those known as the Ardut Lily, uh, who are affiliated with a Lilith aspect. The word Ardutu was a term that describes a young woman of marrying age. age. Thus, the Ardut Lily were sexually active female spirits, and so they could be the equivalent of the succubi. It was believed that these night uh, demonesses were, uh, were the ones who did cause uh, erotic dreams by which they robbed the male of semen and spiritual vitality. Of course, there is also a male version of this entity, uh, the incubus. Um, so they have both. So we, we also have this aspect within Sumerian beliefs. It is also interesting to note that the Sumerian word uh, for wantonness was lilu. And that which is luxurious was lalu uh, in Sumeria. So uh, you, you got to keep note of these roots. Unlike others who often viewed as lower spirits or demons, the uh, magical incantations specifically call her daughter of heaven. So Lilith is understood as a daughter of heaven. This made her unique, for she did good or harm out of her free will, not by preordained designations, as was the case with the, with the demon that the Lamish do. So she had free will. This is another really important aspect to decide whether or not she does good or bad from our perspective. Unusual. That's because she is connected uh, to the heavens. Not quite earthbound demon. So we have to, we, yeah, right. Uh, for those living in ancient Mesopotamia, inclusive of the Sumerians, Akkadians, and the Assyrians, the spirits who were viewed as ultimately subordinate to the high gods like Anu and Enki were called the Shudu and the Lamashu. Uh, these spirits are depicted as, as hybrids, typically with a human head, uh, a lion or bull body, and having wings. They could act either as good or evil, depending on the shidu, and sometimes a little of both, but they did not have free will. Right? The shidu, lamashtu, uh, as beneficial, were depicted as guardians that protect people and houses and temples. Oftentimes their images were buried under the door's threshold, 
keeping the evil spirits and evil people influenced by them out of the household. Uh, in grander residences and palace, uh, palaces, the Shebi Lamashtu were carved as a pair of guardians flanking the entrance. Sometimes these are pretty grand in scale, and many of you have seen these in various museums. Of the, um, uh, of course, the uh, other uh, Sidhu or Lamashtu were harmful. They were known to have great powers that are worth fearing. For example, the demon known as Pazuzu. Uh, images of Pazuzu, also simply known as Zoo, <laughs> yes, a nickname, right, are everywhere to be found within the material culture, right? Pazuzu um, has a face of a dog with the bulging eyes, the sharp talons and wings of a bird, and a scaly body, scorpion tail, a uh, snake headed penis. Watch out for that. Uh, Pazuzu uh, was believed to be the demon of the southwest wind. As an evil spirit, uh, he is the one who took the tablets of Enlil's destiny and was killed because of this. Uh, he's the one who brought about diseases that have no cure uh, connected to pestilence. Yet with, with Azuzu, a spirit often viewed as, as evil, could have to do good actions. In fact, there's another tradition uh, that's interesting in Mesopotamia that uh, Azuzu is believed to be able to have the power to ward off the southwest and west wind. As an evil spirit, Pazuzu still could be called upon to attack other evil spirits for the greater benefit of humanity. So Pazuzu was oftentimes invoked to fight against Lamashtu. So, you know, evil against evil. Have you guys ever seen the exorcist? Right, right. That's, that's Pazuzu, right? Uh, but uh, so there is this this idea of, a, well, you know, the beat of the bad guys. Sometimes you'll have to use bad guys to fight the even bigger bad guys. So, okay. Lamashtu, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, demoness has a head of a lioness, donkey's teeth and ears, very hairy body, long fingers, and bird feet with long talons. Pretty attractive. Uh, uh, she's uh, oftentimes nursing a, a dog or a pig. Yeah, that. You ever see something like that? You no, know, that's that's the honest truth. We see that all the time nowadays. Maybe that's that's the thrill of 2021. Okay, so uh, moving right along, but joking aside, uh, she's often poised to attack the unborn, the newly born, or nursing infants. We gotta know this now, right? Uh, making threats to new mothers. So we're going to see now the Lamashtu aspect will eventually connect to the Lilith aspect. You guys getting this? The Lamashtu aspect will eventually connect to the Lilith aspect. Yet yeah, we're almost there, right? So accordingly, with the Lamashtu, uh, you know, she, yeah, as I mentioned, she threatens mothers. Uh, she typically gnaws on their bones and she sucks their blood able to touch the woman's pregnant belly seven times, she will miscarriage. Stop her from doing so. Women often wore amulets to protect their bellies. And sometimes this image was of bronze, and it's sometimes the head of Pazuzu, uh, her narch nemesis, right? Uh, she also enjoys slaying men and drinking their blood. Sounds like a good time had by all. You know, with this said, um, uh, even the typically evil Lamashtu is used as a magic to heal. <laughs> Why? Because once again, it's the idea that you take the bad guys and uh, who fight the even bigger bad guys. You know, let them fight amongst themselves. And I actually have right here a spell, a protective spell that uses Lamashtu, and why not? I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, this is a, is, a, is a spell to get rid of lasting fever. It goes as, basically, it says the prescribed ritual is involves lamish to figurine. You gotta get that. Sacrifice of bread must be placed before the figure, and water must be poured over it. Then a black dog must be made to carry the figurine. Then it is placed near the head of a sick child for three days, with the heart of a piglet placed in its mouth. 
right? The, the incantation must be recited three times a day, uh, besides further food sacrifices. Then at uh, dusk on the third day, the figure is taken outdoors and buried near the wall. There you have it. I'm not going to go ahead and read the spell. Long, but uh, you get the idea of how uh, it operated. Right? So she was used for uh, good as well. But Lilith was different. Lilith, uh, she could do good or evil as a result of her own free will, and as opposed to being, and was opposed to being harnessed as some magical tool. She didn't like that too much. Uh, she produced by inspiring sexual activity. And this, of course, affected the life of plants and animals. But just as quickly, she could change her mind and take life away. She, yeah, so she could, in a sense, give life and take it away. You know, she seduced men to have sex uh, for the natural energy to perpetuate life. But she would also harm women about to give birth. She could kill a baby if she wishes. But the surviving incantations make it clear that she could also, get this, save babies too. If she desired, it could cause sickness and death and even kill plants. It could reverse and, and reverse and, and, of course, bring them back as well. In a sense, already by the time of the Sumerians and Babylonians, Lilith was understood as a very unpredictable free agent neither quite God or demon, but hovering somewhere in the realm of in-between. He was definitely used for fertility magic uh, in a positive way, but not for human fertility magic. Um, but she could also do the opposite, right? Because of her liminal nature, Lilith would take on attributes of even the iconography, not only of Inanna, but of Rishkagol, uh, the, the goddess of the land of the dead uh, and the underworld, right? There's some certain characteristics uh, that are common, but you kind of saw that already before. But now we get to the Assyrians. I'm glad we had a little time to really investigate her uh, early on. By the time of the Assyrians, things start going downhill. The little two were more and more collective demons. Right, uh, associated with storms and disease and lions in the desert. Uh, they were also known to fall upon women and children. One amulet uh, from Arslan Tosh contains an incantation against Lilith with an image showing a sphinx-like creature with wings devouring a child. Another incantation describes her as follows. It says, the space between her legs is as a scorpion corresponding to the astrological sign of Scorpio. Uh, so you know, the Scorpio rules the genitals and sex organs. Right? Her head is that of a lion. Uh, she has an undo bird feet like Lilithu. Her breasts are suckled by a pig and a dog, and she rides the back of a donkey. Uh, she is described as the seven enchantresses, or seven witches. Already you're getting this association by the time of the Assyrians. Or, or again, we're going uh, chronologically. Yet Lilith was also worshipped still during the time of the Assyrians, around the 7th century BCE, and even into the Neo-Babylonian period. Uh, and it was part of what's called the uh, Shedim cult, S-H-E-D-I-M. And this cult was also evident in Israel. Oh, here we go. You guys ready for this? So during the Neo-Babylonian period, you're tracking here, uh, you have the Shedim cult that is still worshiping Lilith. And this idea is spreading uh, and it's crossing over into the area of Israel. The Shedim were basically elemental demons associated with water, often known as storm gods, uh, Jewish stories. Concerning the, the, their origins include the belief that uh, they arose from demons. But they took upon the, the, the form of serpents. Uh, in fact, there's a story where God made uh, their, their spirits, but he didn't give them bodies. And so they had to find 
these spirit bodies, which turned out to be serpents, right? So now we have the Lilithu, the Lilith, the ideas uh, entering into Jewish conceptions. And so we enter into the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Hebrew Bible itself will definitely have uh, the word Lilith or Lilith in Isaiah uh, 34, 14. Um, it mentions them. And I got to tell you, these translators translate it every way possible. They don't know how to translate it. I mean, I I'm looking through the various descriptions. Night creatures, night monster for the word Lilithu, night egg, screech owl. I mean, so many variations, right? Night jar? A night jar? Really? <laughs> Now, okay, that's the, the, the 1984 New World Translation, right? <laughs> Where the night dark, the night devil, you know, they're, they're obviously, there's a lot of bias here. Uh, smart Bible translators will simply call them Lilith. <laughs> Maybe it's best to leave it untranslated if you just can't get it even close. Uh, but uh, there you have it. So, so the Lilith doesn't really go into uh, its significance just seems to be not so positive, right? Um, and that's it. Then, of course, we go into the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, they appear, uh, Lilith does appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Jewish Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, within a list of monsters. So now we know they're understood as monsters. Uh, and so, um, um, and I, the instructor, proclaim his glorious splendor so as to frighten and terrify all the spirits of the destroying angels, spirits of the bastards, demons, Lilith, howlers, and desert dwellers, and those which fall upon men without warning to lead them astray from the spirit of understanding and to make their heart and their, and there's, of course, you know, breaking it. So we have this, akin to Isaiah 34, 14, uh, in the Dead Sea uh, Scrolls. There's a liturgical text both cautions against the presence of supernatural malevolence and assumes very much a familiarity with uh, Lilith, right? Uh, so we have that here. Uh, I just will go ahead. He is, um, uh, of course, help protect the faithful against the power of the spirits. Um, and uh, we have some other stories here. There's so many. Uh, the Lilith tradition within the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, uh, you have, of course, one where the Lilith is a description of a precarious uh, woman known as the Sedatrix. Uh, this ancient uh, poem was from the first century BCE, it describes a dangerous woman and consequently warns against encounters with her. Right. And she's also depicted as a strange woman, which is oftentimes connected to Proverbs 2 and 5. Um, so, uh, in fact, Proverbs uh, 2 says, her house sinks down to death and her house leads to the shades. All who go to her cannot return and find again the path of life. Meanwhile, the Dead Sea Scroll says about her, her gates are gates of death and from the entrance of the house, it goes out towards Sheol. None of those who enter there will ever return and all who possess her will descend to the pit. So you're getting this, this, this identity now of Lilith in connection to the underworld. Of course, we know that it was of the overworld. So she's moving from the heavens within the uh, Sumerian uh, tradition, Neo-Babylonian tradition, uh, kind of heavens, but still moving into the realm of the earth. And now she's getting associated with the underworld. So things are definitely changing pretty quick. Um, we have also descri descriptions of her. She now has horns, and she's acquired wings, right? Uh, so she's gaining that. In the Testament of Solomon, uh, from 200 BCE to 200 CE, uh, we have more references uh, to Lilith. And I do want to explore this a little bit more. Here we go. Talks about, no, she goes, this is Lilith also goes by the name of Obazuth, 
uh, O-D-I-Z-U-T-H. Uh, but she later on is revealed as Lilith. And it goes as follows. Um, Lilith um, reveals herself. And it says, Solomon says, I, Solomon, uh, did she enjoin me and strain myself because of the wisdom dwelling in me, in order that I might hear of her deeds and apprehend them and manifest them to men. And I sat down and said to the demon, who are they? And she said, I am called amongst men, Obazu, and by night I sleep not, but go my rounds over all the world and visit women in childbirth. And divining the hour, I take my stand. And if I am lucky, I strangle the child. If not, I retire to another place, for I cannot a single night retire unsuccessful. I am a fierce spirit of a myriad of names and of many apes. Now hither, now thither I roam, and to western parts I go my rounds. But as it now is, though thou hast sealed me round with the ring of God, thou hast done nothing. I am not standing before thee, and thou wilt not be able to command me, for I have no work other than the destruction of children and the making of their ears to be deaf and the workings of evil to their eyes, and the binding of their mouths with a bond, and the ruin of their minds, and the painting of their bodies. When I, Solomon, heard this, I marveled at her appearance, for I beheld all her body to be in darkness. But her glance was altogether bright and cheery. Huh? bright and cheery, and her hair was tossed wildly like a dragon's, and the whole of her limbs were invisible. Bright and cheery? Remember the smile that you saw in the earlier Lilith image? She's known for her smile all the way through time. She still has also retain that beauty that she had from the earlier times that has not yet changed. She is still considered wild and her hair is bound eventually in, uh, in submission, right? Of course, you're gonna see the importance of Lilith's hair in the Talmud, uh, which will play an important role, right? So Lilith is used uh, as a lesson a lesson, excuse me, the sh uh, basically uh, for those people who have sinned uh, in a sexual way. Uh, so always an object lesson, but still getting a lot of material of the old Lilith as she unfortunately continues to, to dwindle. Uh, you can see also uh, she is a understood now as child destroying. Uh, and uh, and so now you're going to start seeing uh, various in archaeology various um, objects, amulets meant to ward her off, to protect babies from her power. Now we move on to the Talmud, 200 to 500 CE. Wow, we're making some progress, aren't we? We're going through time. You didn't think we got this far, huh? Okay, so uh, we look at the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, and um, Story goes, uh, for example, uh, she does have wings. Uh, the Talmud states uh, as, as follows, uh, if an abortion has the likeness of Lilith, its mother is unclean by reason of birth. It is a child, but it has wings. So it was also taught. It's kind of, kind of, kind of interesting. It continues. Um, uh, it says, it, uh, in fact, it mentions that uh, it once mentioned that uh, a woman aborted the likeness of a Lilith, and um, it did have in, indeed wings. But it, what's interesting about this is it mentions the abortion as a common practice. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, just to be fun, controversial topic. Now we're basically moving to the Talmud. 
Okay, moving right along, uh, you also have uh, Lilith is also described as having very long hair. Uh, in one section, it's, it says she grows long hair like Lilith, sits when making water like a beast, and serves as a bolster for her husband. And we know what that means, where she means making water like a beast. <laughs> She's going potty. Okay. Uh, also, uh, in according to the Talmud, the connection with lust, Lilith was already known to seduce and have sex with men uh, in the Talmud. It goes as follows. One may not sleep in a house alone, in a lonely house. And whoever sleeps in a house alone is seized by Lilith. <laughs> so you better get married because Lilith will be after you. All right. Uh, perhaps you're, you're you're probably learning way too much <laughs> information. But isn't that why you came here today, right? <laughs> okay. You can see that Lilith becomes this projection of the negative fears and desires of, of the rabbis who 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 uh, depicted her. Right. Uh, it's a nice excuse. It's it's all. It's all Lilith's fault, right? <laughs> yeah, she's the cause, right? All right, so now we move into, of course, uh, uh, the Talmud does seem to talk about Lilith and Adam. Here it starts. Here's the origin of this. Talmud talks about the fact that uh, it says, in all those years, 130 years, after the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, during which time Adam was under the ban, which means that he is practicing chastity, he begot ghosts and male demons and female demons. Now you get what's happening. And of course, this impregnation arrives from Lilith. Uh, the upshot of it is this, is that, you know, supposedly because of what happened to the Garden of Eden, Adam is not hanging around Eve anymore. And so he's uh, declared celibacy. Well, after, of course, you know, step. Right. Uh, and so, but apparently um, uh, Lilith, unbeknownst to him, uh, has been interacting with him, uh, making lots of male and female demons from his essence, his nocturnal missions. Is this making sense? So you already have, now you're going to see how this change changes, of course. Now, the, by the way, the Talmud, Talmud version of, of Lilith does resemble in many ways what we see uh, of the Greek and Roman Lamia. So I'll just kind of throw this one in. Once upon a time, Lamia was the beautiful mistress of Zeus himself, but of course the Delos wife Hera slayed all of her children, right? Except for Scylla and turned her into a hideous demon who hunts and eats children, right? According to another story, Hera uh, basically uh, when she took all her children, killed all her children, Lamia's children, made her lose her mind, and so that she began to kill and eat other children out of a sense of loss and envy. After a while, she turns into a demon due to her lowly excessive and obsessive behavior. Uh, she will eventually have the upper half of a woman and the lower half of the serpent. As for her eyes, Hera accursed her never uh, to close them, but the good news is that she can remove them out of her skull. And there you have it. Uh, that was the good news. I hate to throw the bad news uh, happens to be. Okay. Now, we also have more information. You guys ever heard of the Nippur bowls? These contain uh, some of the most lengthy and explicit references to Lilith up to this point. Out of 40 bowls, which were excavated, 26 mention the figure of Lilith. And at least three of these, of these bowls contain sketches of Lilith as their central image. So they date around five to 600 uh, CE. Uh, that's, a, that's a current date that we have here uh, for them. Uh, so these are special bowls. And they're, they're worth taking a look at. Um, as a whole, these, these uh, have magical incantations against various forms of illnesses and demons. One which features Lilith uh, gives enough information to provide a synopsis of how the, the more simple people viewed her. Um, it appears that Lilith was regarded as a ghostly uh, um, accompaniment of men and had a special danger for women 
during many periods of their sexual life cycle before uh, they lost their virginity during menstruation. A mother in the hour of childbirth and her newborn babe were especially vulnerable and there, therefore had to be protected from the Liliths. It would appear, therefore, that two of the strands of Lilith have joined together at this point, that he is now child slayer and succubus by the time we get to 500 to 600 BCE. Um, I, I guess I'm going to go ahead and read one here. Uh, in one of these, uh, Lilith appears naked and wingless with long, loose hair, chained ankles, and prominent breasts, and strongly marked genitals. Uh, the text goes as follows. You are bound and sealed, all you demons and devils and Liliths, by that hard and strong and mighty powerful bond with which are tied Sison and Sison, the evil Lilith who causes the hearts of men to go astray and appears in the dreams of the night and in the vision of the day, who burns and casts down with nightmares, attacks and kills children, boys and girls. She is conquered and sealed away from the house and from the threshold of Baram Kushnap Sad Ishtar Naid by the talisman uh, of Metatron, the great prince who is called the great healer of mercy. And it goes on forever after that. But you get the idea. By the 8th to 10th centuries, Lilith becomes known as Adam's wife. Now, I'll make it very clear, very clear, that um, these ideas could have occurred earlier. Just because I say they appear at this time doesn't mean they didn't exist earlier. Is this making sense? I'll make it very clear. I'm just giving you the documentation of when it appears, but a lot of things don't get written down until later on. They're part of the oral tradition, or we have lost so many documents from ancient times. But uh, here it does appear. This is called the Alphabet of Sirach, uh, S-I-R-A-C-H, around 700 to 1000 CE. It's anonymous work. Uh, the text, uh, it seems to be a commentary. It tells the story of the conception, birth, and early education of a prophet by the name of Din Sera, right? Um, the text begins kind of strange. Uh, it's a group of men who are masturbating in the bathhouse, and they're talking about what they consider serious topics, like farting, urinating, uh, copulation of ravens and donkeys. Okay, well, it doesn't begin very well. But of course, meanwhile, all of you are now Googling this alphabet of Sirach, going, what in the world is this text about? Yeah, I got you guys. Anyway, so what happens is, is that many people say this is an anti-Jewish satire. So it's it's trying to, you know, it's it's the vaudeville, right, uh, of, of of Judaism, so to speak. But uh, uh, anyway, it could be a parody, right? It's very vulgar at times, kind of absurd at, at other times too. The text uh, is pretty important uh, because it does talk about the fact that uh, she is the, the the first wife, and I will read you the text. Soon afterwards. The young son of the king took ill, said Nebuchadnezzar. Heal my son. If you don't, I will kill you. Then Sarah immediately sat down and wrote an amulet with a holy name. And he inscribed on it the angels in charge of medicine by their names, forms, and images, and by their wings, hands, and feet. Nebuchadnezzar looked at the amulet. Who are these? The angel, <clears throat> the angels who are in charge of medicine. Senoi, Sansanoi, and Smerkan Lof. While God created Adam, who was alone, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. He created a woman from the earth, as he had created Adam himself, and called her Lilith. Adam and Lilith immediately began to fight. He said, I will not lie below. And he said, I will not lie beneath you, but only on top. For you are fit only to be in the bottom position, while I am to be in the superior one. So uh, basically, it's about who's going to be on top or not. I'm serious. That's what the text says. Well, Lilith responded. 
She's very feisty in a good way. Okay. She says, we are equal. I love this. Can you believe this is being said around the 900s BSD? We are equal to each other in as much as we were both created from the earth. But they would not listen to one another. When Lilith saw this, she pronounced the ineffable name and she flew away into the air. See these aspects of, of the Mesopotamian myth now, right? A flying away from the tree. Adam stood in prayer before his creator, sovereign of the universe. He said, the woman you gave me has run away. Well, yeah, because you're a jerk. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, at once the Holy One, blessed be he, sent these three angels to bring her back. Said the Holy One to Adam, if she agrees to come back, what is made is good. If not, she must permit 100 of her children to die every day. What? Right? The angels left God and pursued Lilith whom they overtook in the midst of the sea, in the mighty waters wherein the Egyptians were destined to drown. They told her God's word. She did not wish to return. The angel said, we shall drown you in the sea. She said, leave me. I was created only to cause sickness to infants. If the infant is male, I have dominion over him for eight days after his birth, and a female for 20 days. Well, why is she doing this? Well, he's got to lose a hundred of her kids a day. Come on. <laughs> you're, you're, getting, you're getting this. I mean, she's already punished. So it's kind of like I'm getting back here, right? A little bit, well, quite a bit, right? When the angels heard Lilith's words, right, they insisted, as of course these angels would, that she goes back. And she would, uh, his, but she swore to them, by the name of the living and eternal God, whenever I see you or your names or the forms in the amulet, I will have no power over that infant. We also agreed to have 100 of her children die every day. Rather do have 100 children of her die every day than be with Adam. <laughs> He's quite a kid. Anyway, accordingly, every day, 100 of her demons uh, that came from her perished. But uh, uh, but still, this amulet was believed to be powerful uh, for those uh, protecting the protected children. They could see uh, how Lilith has gained uh, some um, negotiation power here. She still is a free agent, independent agent. She can do whatever she wants to do, whether good or ill. She has that power. We move on to the Kabbalah. Right, 1100 to 1300 CE. Wow! Hey, hey. yeah, we're, we're we're at the Kabbalah finally. <laughs> Thought we ever get there, right? Okay. He occupies the realm of shells known as Kluth, right? Uh, and uh, according uh, to in the area of the Kabbalah Tree of Life, uh, she's the area known as Melkuth, or the Kingdom. The light of God does not emanate directly here, but indirectly via God's creation and can be viewed as representing the earth. Uh, more specifically, Malkuth is the material world, a place of sensual delights. Lilith resides here and she seduces all those who are open to her to embrace uh, this material existence and to enjoy its pleasures. Uh, she is depicted here as very beautiful to behold. In fact, she's mesmerizing. She's an enchantress, right? Uh, and um, and so people, in fact, she looks like one description shows her as a beautiful blue butterfly. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, so what she does is that she wants us to, in a sense, embrace our bestial or natural urges and just to enjoy them uh, in pleasure. In the 13th century, the, the, the Zohar, um, um, especially, especially, uh, especially the Agada adds another story whereby Lilith leaves Adam after refusing his authority and gets together with Archangel Samael <laughs> after having sex uh, with him. And that's the reason why she refuses to go back to the Garden of Eden. 
<laughs> so, so he found somebody better, uh, and that's Samael, right? The story of Lilith and Samael is complicated, but it can be put together through various works from the Kabbalah. According to the Jewish 13th century uh, work known as a left hand emanation, uh, one known as Blind Dragon actually arranges the marriage between Lilith and Samael. It was often specifically viewed as the dragon that is in the sea, also known as the Leviathan. When they get together, uh, Lilith and Samael have sex via the Blind Dragon, uh, which is uh, understood as a snake, according to the left hand emanation. Uh, so they are, so you already know the evil Samael and Wicked Lilith are like a sexual pair who, by means of intermediary, receive an evil and wicked emanation from one and emanate to the other. The heavenly serpent is a blind prince, the image of the intermediary, by my mouth, between Samael and Lilith. And the name, the name is Tama Eva. The master of tradition said that just as this serpent slithers without eyes, so the serpent has the image of a spiritual form without color. These are the eyes. The traditionalists call it an eyeless creature. Therefore, its name is Tananiver. He is the bond, the accompaniment, and the union between Samael and Lilith. If he were created whole in the fullness of his emanation, he would have destroyed the world in the instant. And so, in fact, in many, many, many associations, Lilith is also connected with the serpent. In fact, uh, sometimes Lilith and Samael are both described uh, as serpents. And then you can see where this is going. <laughs> so what will happen is we get into the medieval uh, context. And God castrates Samael to stop Lilith from giving birth to all these demon children. But you're also going to have the story where Lilith is now associated with the snake in the Garden of Eden. You, you, know, you saw this one coming, right? You can see that, again, by going in an evolutionary sense, you're seeing how these ideas start to emerge and they start to come together. Uh, so, uh, of course, the treatise of the left and uh, emanation also goes into the idea uh, that uh, they are both androgynous, uh, ultimately, above all. But they are the counterbalance to Adam and Eve, or the, the evil Adam and Eve in a spiritual sense. Archangel Samuel, of course, uh, appears in the Talmud uh, first around 200 CE. He's known as the severity of God. He is the angel of death, so he is the ultimate bad boy. Right? There, well, there you have it again, right? Like in Lel, right? Uh, and um, he, ha he has a uh, voracious sexual appetite, and they mated with each other a lot, uh, and um, had lots of demons, and so many demons come out as a result of that. Uh, he is also known to interact with the angels of prostitution. Uh, and uh, we have those as well. I'm looking at my, my time here. Uh, but, uh, and so I'll, I'll just mention a few here. Uh, he interacts, for example, with Isaac, right? Uh, who is in the realm of the shells uh, and who can saw, conceive, sorry, conceals the face of mercy. Uh, and the demons connected to her have black veiled heads with their hideous eyes peering through and horns and are accompanied by evil, evil centaurs. Yep. Uh, he also has uh, a connection with Agret Malat, known as the dancing roof demon. <laughs> Gotta watch out for that one. Uh, also, Nima, who happens to be a uh, female companion of Lilith. So, uh, Quite, quite, a, quite a spread, so to speak. Uh, there's other versions of the story where, where she is connected to Osmodius, uh, as opposed uh, to Thamael. So there you have it. And of course, the Zohar uh, goes into the fact that, um, that it's possible that Lilith will be redeemed. Uh, we don't have time to interact with that, but uh, that Lilith will, will ascend at a certain point. So to have that concept as well, and that she is born, originated, uh, according to the Zohar, from the flames of the cherubim's swords. And so she is now having an angelic aspect to her. 
So again, she's not all bad, right? Of course, uh, when we get to the uh, keys of Solomon, Lilith uh, may be a demonic uh, counterpart uh, to various stars. In fact, um, um, I will mention this, we're almost done, I know, but uh, uh, as you know, the cherubim are connected to various fixed stars of the constellations, each one designated to the stars, and Lilith stands guard. But Lilith is actually a guard of the star, known as Agol, a fixed star in the constellation of Taurus. This star is called Lilith Star, according to the Jewish legend. Interestingly enough, the same star uh, is connected to the Eye of Medusa that Perseus used to turn his enemies into stone, right? And the Algol talisman uh, is considered good luck uh, for success or petitions to be carried around and a ward against evil. So even already this far in, Lilith has negative, but she, she also has positive aspects as well. well as you see, eventually, uh, things are going to start to go downhill, um, where uh, uh, with the uh, new moon, uh, she is connected. Well, I would just kind of have to go through this because we ran out of time. I, 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 want, I want to say a few things, more things, just if you don't mind. Give me a few more moments here. Um, I will mention that um, we know that uh, during the time of the new moon, Lilith toys with children making them laugh. Uh, and this is the secret of the children laughing in their sleep when they are small. It is from Lilith who plays with them. And I heard that when a small child laughs during the Sabbath night or night of the new moon, it is because Lilith is playing with him. And it is well that his father or mother or anyone who sees him laugh should tap him in the nose with a finger and say, go from here, you accursed one, uh, for you have no resting place here. Let him say this three times, and each time he recites this incantation, let him tap the child's nose. So there you have that. And give me about five more minutes. I will just mention a few other things, because there's some. There's a few more stories I want to tell you so badly. Okay, so Lilith uh, becomes a companion, supposedly, of Pope Sylvester II, a pope from 999 to 1003. They fell in love. So Lilith and he had a relationship, supposedly. Uh, who says this? The English uh, monk by the name of William of Malmesbury, uh, who wrote, uh, who lived between, excuse me, 1095 to 1143. The story goes is that the future Pope Sylvester, he was actually a sorcerer. He had special knowledge. I mean, he was really good at mathematics. Well, that explains everything, right? Uh, but he's also known to be a great philosopher, a magician, and, uh, and he had uh, had some way of avoiding uh, evil by hiding under bridges because it's a realm between the, the world above and the land below, which is kind of strange. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, nobody loved him. He just couldn't get a girl. I know, it's sad. Uh, he even fashioned a brazen head of bronze that, that was mechanical that could say yes or no to various answers. I mean, I mean that would win anybody over, right? Okay, so, so what happens is that uh, he was lonely, rejected by everybody, especially the one woman he loved. And so he met Mara Diana. He met Mara Diana while walking in the woods uh, near a church. Uh, he described her as an angel. She happened to be bathing in a nearby river. She was completely naked. And of course, he's a voyeur. Watch her for a while. He's, she spotted him. The two meet. Temptation was too much to take. And then all of a sudden, he blanked out. This is what they all say. And he woke up in his bed, in his room, with her next to him. Okay. Mary Diana uh, was very satisfied with the meal as a succubus, uh, who is, of course, uh, a Lilith. He announced that she knows of his little loneliness problem and could give uh, him a hand in that under two conditions. One, he could never tell anyone uh, that she was around. And also, uh, 
uh, two, that uh, he could not be with anybody else. And she could be with anybody else, but he couldn't. It's kind of exclusive. So, so she enjoyed his, her various meals with him. But then she actually starts to fall in love with him, and she doesn't go with anybody else. And the two are together, and she gives him lots of favors, and eventually helps him become Pope. So he knows uh, is that one time he, he she was told he told she told him that he could not perform any mass in Jerusalem because the devil would get him, and um, so he canceled his pilgrimage. But he did perform mass at San Croce in uh, Jerusalem, in Rome, and apparently that counted even though it wasn't really Jerusalem, and she was attacked by a devil, uh, tried to gouge out his eyes, uh, cut off his hand and tongue, and admitted, probably before he cut off his tongue, that he had this succubus. All right, so we have, of course, now we're wrapping up here, or, or anything's up. So there's going to be a revival. What? Yes, a revival of Lilith. Uh, she's going to be restored. Uh, Goethe starts that work. A little bit, right? Uh, and Faust, who's that there? Says Faust. Menestopheles says, take a good look. Lilith. Lilith, who is that? Menestopheles says, Adam's wife, his first, beware of her. Her beauty's one boast is her dangerous hair. When Lilith winds it tight around young men, she doesn't soon let go of them again. And of course, um, Another part here is is that um, Faust uh, is encouraged to dance with the pretty witch, uh, and um, and so it, it seems to be a very lovely uh, time, a lovely dream. I dreamt one day I saw a green leaf apple tree, two apples swayed upon a stem, so tempting I climbed up for them. The pretty witch, ever since the days of Eden. Apples have been man's desire. How overjoyed I am to think, sir, apples grow too in my garden. Then we have, of course, the famous painting by uh, Rossetti, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and he wrote a nice poem. Now, I want, since this is how I'm going to conclude, well, I'm going to conclude one more part, one more, I'll do rounding real quick, but I just want to do two more. Okay. So Rossetti goes as follows. It says, of Adam's first wife, Lilith is, it is told, the witch he loved before the gift of Eve, that ere the snakes, her sweet tongue could deceive, and her enchanted hair was the first gold. And still she sits, young while the earth is old, and suddenly of herself contemplative, draws men to watch the bright web she can weave, the heart and body and life are in its hold. The rose and poppy are her flower for where is he not found, O Lilith, whom shed scent and soft shed kisses and soft sleep shall snare. Lo, as that youth's eyes burned in thine, so went thy spell through him and left his straight neck bent around his heart one strangling golden hair. And finally... Robert Browning in his poem that was published in 1883, known as Adam, Lilith, and Eve. Uh, here, uh, Eve admits that she never loved Adam, while Lilith confesses that she always loved him. Uh, as the worst of the venom lift my lips, I thought, if desire this lie, he strips the mask for my soul with a kiss I crawl, his slave, soul, body, and all. And so you have the redemption of Lilith. Uh, she is brought back. She's re-empowered. And she becomes an image, a goddess again, who is understood to make her own choice. She has complete, complete free will to do as she wishes. And she has the power of the knowledge and intuition to do so. I hope that you have understood all the labyrinth of the evolution uh, that is Lilith, uh, because I'll be honest, most scholars have been um, tricked by Lilith here and there to and fro because she defies description and full understanding uh, and sometimes um, 
uh, she, uh, in her way, uh, is meant to be a mystery. And you know what? In this life, sometimes a mystery is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank Can you. I ask a quick question? Sorry. Yes. Sure. I have yeah, a sure. question um, I put in the chat. Oh. Just at the end. About the story um, of Lilith fleeing, fleeing from Adam. Does that come from the Talmud? Or where does that one come from? Oh, okay. Okay, well, the Talmud talks about uh, Lilith uh, uh, connecting with Adam, you know, connecting with Adam uh, in the nocturnal emissions after he does the celibacy thing. So, so that's, uh, I'm seeing all these questions here. Wait, where, 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 where is the question here? I lost my thought here. Sorry. Yeah. No. Sorry, um, the oh, one that I had was just where does that story come from for, of her fleeing, basically from Adam, with oh, that fleeing. really beautiful quote that you told us about. Oh, we're both oh, from the oh, earth. Oh, oh, like, oh, yeah, where that, did that come from? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's the Kabbalah. Yeah. Thank you. That was all I wanted to know. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see lots of questions. That's the. Does a heart get changed each day for all three? You know, the spell does not say. That means I would assume it just has to stay there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, and um, yeah, what's, what's other questions here? Um, I have a, I have a question regarding the um, Gilgamesh. And yeah. so what was the second creature that took root in the uh, tree? Are you talking about, you're talking about the bird? I yeah. second that, yeah. Uh, what type of bird was it? Okay. So the bird. All right. A bird. But I want to make sure I got it right here. Hello, Patrice. Yeah, just give me two seconds here. I'm looking for you. Yeah, Anzu. It's a what? Anzu. Bird. Anzu. A N Z U. -E. Anzu bird. So that's the idea that it's of the branches above. Uh, and of course, the serpent is below. And you're, it's, it is the realm of the heavens or the air and the realm of the earth. And of course, that has a world trade concept. Um, I have a second question. Sure. What was the other two children after the god of death when she was traveling through the underworld? Oh, OK. You mean, you mean the ones that uh, I was rushing through? Yeah. And, uh, I, I really like that story. Really interesting. Okay. Okay. So we go. All right. Okay. Uh, so the names are. Oh, yeah. Of course, I translate them. So, but I'll, I'll give you the. Okay. So the names are. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, Nurgle. Next one is. Uh, Nina Zhu. And the third is N Belulu. I'll spell them out. Nurgle, N R G A L. Next one is Nenazu, N I N A Zu. A -A -Z -A -Z -A. I'm talking too long. N I N A Z U. Uh, and the third is E N B I L U L U, who is the inspector of canals. So. <laughs> What was, so uh, my question was rather, instead of their names, what were they the gods of? Okay, so so the first one is the god of the entry gate. 
uh, into uh, the children. Oh, the, oh, the children. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, what will happen is the, the first one uh, becomes mm -hmm. known as the gatekeeper. Okay. Second one is will be known as the man of the river. And the third is the god of rivers and canals. Does that help? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting story. Um, I said, yes, go ahead. Sorry, you said um, earlier, you said the owls weren't realistic. You said something wasn't realistic attached to her. Yeah, okay. So yes, owls do well within trees. And, and yes, owl is connected to, to her iconography. And I mean, I could see that. But having the word Lilitu, meaning owl, is kind of a stretch because it goes against the etymology of the word oh, when it comes to ancient, ancient Sumerian, as, as well as when it amalgamates with Akkadian. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean owl, it means we understood it, it means air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it, then it amalgamates with the Akkadian, it connects to the realm, it means night or darkness. So, so to just say, hey, it's an owl, uh, uh, doesn't seem to be very responsible, even though owls are connected because they are of the night right they're mm -hmm. here and, they, they're and like the air yeah fronts, you know they, they are air in that sense so they have the attributes so it makes them perfect to connect with lilith mm. but not lilith the word yeah because the, word, the etymology yeah the, the word goes against and also the other understandings of that because our conception really is lost but the, the air spirit demon aspect is what continues on with its name. Yeah, you mentioned the feet were also part of the owl too. Yeah, 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 okay. the, yeah the claws. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's the iconography. So what it is, is that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a chicken before the egg, <laughs> which mm -hmm. comes first. But I, from my perspective is, is, that, is that the owl represents the attributes but does it mean it's an owl? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good, 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 good question. Yeah. Any others? What was the name of the star that you said is associated with Lilith? Algol. Algol, but it's in Taurus. It's not in Perseus. Taurus. And how is it spelled? Uh, A L G O L. Oh. A L G O L. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, if if the Lilith is understood as, as as being evil or problematic, why would you, why would she be connected to the power, the energy, of, of the wings of a cherubim, not the wings, but the sword of a cherubim? Why would why would she be connected to a star that has magical properties? So you you I, see that they, they they don't have her figured out. Mm. I always thought um, I read that Algol was connected to Medusa as opposed to because it's losing one's head. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty much that. the definition. No, it's, yeah, it's a good connection. But you yeah. you said that it was also connected to her as well. Yes, absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, according to yeah, that's according to the Kabbalah. <laughs> yeah, of all places. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Michelle. She says, are there any sources that suggest people used to pray to Lilith to take a pregnancy baby away? Old school abortion-ish. Uh, since she was in charge of uh, killing babies, it would be, if you didn't want one, could you pray to her to have it taken away? I don't, okay, I'll say this. I don't see any evidence for that, but I believe that is very possible. The problem is, the problem is, is that Lilith sometimes did more than abort the baby. It hurt the mother. That's the fear. So if Lilith went just too far, because remember, uh, she is the one who, but what I didn't mention, uh, now that we're, we've got a little bit more time, is sometimes Lilith was connected to making a woman unable to bear children. So that was that's another aspect so she made them barren so like herself 
And so that was, and so you have that association. So, uh, so she's connected to that. Uh, she's connected to pain administration, unfortunately. So, I mean, her whole thing is very strange in, in, the, in the sense that she is not about procreation you know, in the, or for humanity. She's all about nature and its procreation. And those energies are to be used elsewhere. But um, I don't know how those priestesses uh, are able to, I mean, there's probably possibilities they're not able to have, have children through their activities. You know, I mean, I'm, we probably can imagine a few ways that they achieve this, but um, um, I don't, I'm not sure if that would be all the ways. So, so in working with her, um, I don't know if this, you know, anything about working with her, but if, in working with her, would that make someone then infertile um, as an exchange or not necessarily? Not necessarily. But unless, you're would, unless you're verbally sacrificing something, right. I guess. It would encourage you to be single. <laughs> you know, there'd be, a, I mean, that's not, it's not really a joke. I don't know why I'm laughing. No, no, encourage... no. I mean, no, please tell me more because that's it, it, interesting. It, 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 no, it would, it would encourage because uh, we find from the Mesopotamian as uh, documents, which I, I actually mentioned and quoted, mm -hmm. that uh, perpetual Lilith, maiden. Yeah, perpetual maiden. Yeah, you are to stay, not, not stay, stay celibate. Mm -hmm. sex, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, she likes want, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, with multiple partners you know, yeah. in that sense, but, yeah. but not when it comes to a, a committed relationship. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, even with her uh, mentioned in the Kabbalah, uh, what did she do? She, you know, she go, goes away from Adam because she doesn't like the sexual position, but he's kind of a really not very nice about the whole thing. Yeah. Really and, and so she goes off to Samael, but the Samael, you know, they meet like crazy. But uh, she is also mating with other people, you know, mm. and, and uh, he's mating with others. And just towards the end of my talk, I was rattling it off. Uh, three, of the, three of the demonesses he's mating with, and one of them is her, like her best friend, <laughs> you know, her companion. You know? so, yeah. so it's non-exclusionary uh, from that perspective. Mm. So, so in working with her, she would encourage that, the kind of maiden aspect, well, being I mean, single. She, I guess the best way is she did encourage that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, it's not a critique or, or, or a, something problem, problematic at all. Just that's what the history says is that she encourages, you know, that, that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's, she's, she, and, and you can see where she goes against the marital conception, you know, where, you know, uh, so she's preserving this, but when it comes to, to marriage, it's like, hey, you know, no mm -hmm. to, to procreation, no to having kids. And however, yeah, you did notice that she sometimes could be used to help kids and save kids. And I'm wondering what that mm -hmm. context is. And I'm wondering if that is out of because remember we talked about the story of Enlil, and they had the moon god outside of marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Right from the beginning. So, I mean, there, there and, and she had, she made it with those all the way down, right? She had a God. So it seems to be like, well, if you have a kid outside of, I'm not, I'm not supporting or going to, or, or going against it. I'm just being mm -hmm. honest, you know, I mean, from that story, which I told in detail, it seems to say, well, procreation, if you have a kid and you're not married, maybe it doesn't go, maybe it goes well, you know? And so maybe the, the anger is toward Oh, no. it just, it just, it just, like I said, that's that's the beauty of the. Uh, oh, I like to talk a lot. Is is I, I actually read the documents for your, for you to hear it. So you have actually heard the documentation yourself, and you can discern from there what you think. But from what the evidence that you 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 heard from the primary sources written at that time, it does seem to suggest that idea. So even though it's, a, it's kind of a dichotomy where she's procreated a bunch, but she doesn't really like that. Yeah. But when, okay. it, comes to, when it comes to the natural realm, where there's a parallel with Inanna, right? Where you have, you know, the idea, the, 
of the king of various cities uh, in Mesopotamia. You know, he would he would go up in uh, into the temple, into the ziggurat, right, and go to the top, and they would have the hieros gamos, right? They'd have the holy marriage. In some cases, that was with Inanna in a spirit form. In some other cases, it was uh, a priestess that was chosen from the city to be with the king for that procreative event, not meant for procreation in the womb, but meant for what? To strengthen his king kingship, uh, as well as to give this power of heaven and earth as mitigated by the king and to the realm around it. I mean, so you, this is, it's fascinating. Or it would be his wife, <laughs> who has Inanna within her. So, so you could see some of these parallels. That's why you could see that Inanna uh, and, and Lilith, they, they, you know, one is, you know, obviously Lilith is the handmaiden of Inanna. So you could see where this connection is also. And Inanna is not really, a, if you take a look, I did a talk a while ago on Inanna. Uh, she's not really into marriage either. <laughs> look at her. Nope. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> So thank yeah. you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, there's another question in the chat uh, from Ricky B. When did paganism start working with her, and is there any record of it? When is when is I mean, I mean neo paganism? I guess. I, 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 mean, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, as how we understand. I mean, we have Lilith being very important uh, all the way from the beginning as as worship. Uh, right from the time of the ancient Sumerians uh, and to the Neo-Babylonians. It just kind of gets a little rocky when we get to the Assyrians, new cult, right? Uh, and, uh, but uh, aspects of her still continue to thrive. Um, are we talking about the reinvigoration of, 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 of her in the 19th and 20th centuries? Because, you know, romanticism uh, does revive her uh, on many different levels. You know? So, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure of the context of that question. Or if we, are we talking about modern day uh, paganism? Because I know. Yeah, I would uh, say more the of modern day. I would say, it. yeah, more modern day. Like it, when, what, like, what, is there any record of it in anywhere that all of a sudden she just became this amazing great goddess that paganism started to work with yeah, the I, mean, I understand the history but when in this modern day did it really come to life yeah the unfortunate uh she lived from 1890 to four, uh, 1946 british occultist uh she's the one uh who said the virgin mary is reflected in lilith uh and uh and she's the one who started to rehabilitate her uh, Lilith was uh, shown as a succubus uh, in, in Aleister Crowley's *The Art Magica*. Uh, so uh, that's not and used in his chaos magical work, um, uh, you know. And so, yeah, uh, based on a earlier German rite I have here, uh, there is a ceremonial invocation to Lilith. Dark is she, but brilliant. Black are her wings, black on black. Her lips are red as rose, kissing all of the universes. She is Lilith who leadeth forth the hordes of the abyss and leadeth man to liberation. She is the irresistible fulfiller of all lust, seer of desire. First of all women was she, Lilith, not Eve, was the first. Her hand brings forth the revolution of the will and true freedom of the mind. She is Ki Siakil Nililaki, queen of the magic. Look on her lust and despair. Yeah, so I mean, there. Uh, also, uh, Charles Leland, uh, associated Aradia with Lilith. Uh, Aradia is Herodias, who is regarded uh, in the Italian folklore as being associated with Diana as chief of witches. Uh, Gerald Gardner. Uh, uh, also uh, worshipped her and saw uh, her as, you know, as as prominent as being uh, a goddess that was personified uh, by the priestess in various heavens. Uh, also, uh, Doreen, 
Valente, right? Uh, also cited her as as an important goddess. So I guess I hope that answers. I guess I did. Goes on uh, that's on. That's Thank that's you. Terrible. Within modern paganism. Because yeah. when I say hear Thank paganism, you. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. When I hear paganism, I think Greco-Roman paganism. Oh, I agree. Oh. Now yeah. I'm thinking more modern day. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I hope that answers your question. So totally it does. Thank you. Yeah. So so the so basically early 20th century. But uh, I would I would definitely say Goethe uh, and Romanticism really set that up. It, you know, it, it, it empowered her in a poetic sense. And then of course uh, the ritual ideas continued. I, I do want to give away something else. Uh, there is a version of Lilith uh, that was worshipped in the Middle East and continued to be worshipped uh, up until modern times, at least into the 20th century. So just a, there's some documentation, but it, it died out apparently during the First World War or during the, the Ottoman end of the Ottoman period. So uh, we, we had vestiges of this ancient worship that continued for a while. So. That would be something for scholars to do more research. Any other questions? Yeah. Was this was this fun? Oh yeah. Okay. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I'm glad you guys, glad you guys uh, enjoyed it. 